Hi, this is Stephen from Own a Disown, and today I am taking a look at the Gigabyte Sabre 17 Gaming Notebook. It's fairly thin, certainly compared to the likes of the MSI GT73 VR, and also it's quite light, even with the power brick. My unit is powered by the quad-core i7-7700 HQ CPU, which turbos up to 3.8 GHz and has a GTX 1050 Ti with 4 GB of VRAM. It can also be configured with a GTX 1050 for $1,100, but to be honest, I would swing for this model, a 1050 Ti, Amazon sells it for $1,200, and at that price point, I think it is quite good value. That model has a 256 gigabyte SSD versus the equally priced Omen 17 that has 128 gigabytes. ASUS has the equally configured GL753VE, but that is $100 more expensive. Now the Sabre 17 fits right between the GTX 1050 models at the low end and the GTX 1060 ones that usually start around $1,400. And as you will see shortly, the Sabre 17 holds its own at the native resolution of 1920 by 1080 at high to very high settings. I find its design is quite understated, but I mean that in a good way. It has no bling to show that it's a gaming machine, but some might find that boring, but I like it, as it looks, it would fit very well into a workplace environment. It is made of solid ABS plastic, and there is little screen or keyboard flex. On the right hand side, we have a separate headphone and microphone jacks, a USB 2 port, which to be honest is rather strange, a USB 3 port and a ventilation grill. On the left hand side, we have a Kensington lock, a power jack, ethernet port, one mini display port 1.3, uh, which comes from the uh, Nvidia GPU and that allows you to connect to a 4K G-Sync display. Now there is a second mini display port, but that is 1.2 and that connects to the Intel uh, GPU. We have an HDMI 1.4, a USB 3.1 type C, a USB 3 port, and finally a six in one memory card reader. So it has lots of fair uh, video out possibilities making it great for productivity work. The panel is 60 hertz, it's an IPS, and has an anti-glare coating applied. That is certainly adequate for playing uh, next to a window or doing some work outside. Now, viewing angles, for, you know, are quite good, as you'd expect from, from an IPS display. Color accuracy is actually on par with a highly regarded Aero 15, so I think that is very good at this price point. It is better than the TN panel on the QHD Alienware 17R4. Now, perhaps it's not the brightest at 100%, but as you can see, it remains fairly bright at 25%, which does help to conserve battery life. Now, despite its small 47 watt hour battery, I did manage to squeeze out four hours, 24 minutes. This is because the display is uh, not G-Sync, it uses Optimus technology using the Intel GPU for, for basic tasks such as web browsing. Sure, it didn't last as long as a similarly equipped Dell Inspiron 15 7000 Gaming or the Aero 15, but it did last longer than the lower powered Sager NP5855. It may not get you through a full workday, but it will certainly get you through a couple of movies. One huge plus is the removable battery. So you can always carry a spare one just in case you need to increase its runtime. You will notice the large ventilation grills underneath and the large feet that allows good airflow. There are two 2 watt speakers and they fire downwards at the front. As you can see inside, there seems to be enough space to fit a subwoofer and to be honest, I think it's an omission. It's a shame that uh, yeah, there's not a subwoofer, yet there's one in the Dell Inspiron 15 7000 Gaming which has a 15 inch chassis. Still, the speakers were okay, 78 decibels and they didn't sound tinny. Sure, they are no match uh, on the Dell, but compared to the much bigger ASUS G752VS, they were definitely better. Sound Blaster Cinema 3 software is pre-installed, and you can use this software to choose uh, the usual profile, such as movies, gaming, or voice, as well as alter the crystallizer, the bass, and smart volume that automatically adjusts the loudness. The first thing that uh, struck me when uh, I removed the 16 screws to remove the back was the two uh, separate uh, heat pipes. Often, you see the CPU and the GPU sharing heat pipes, which always seems to make the CPU hot when gaming, but does actually help it keep it cool when you're just doing CPU stress uh, tests by itself. I do wish that the CPU did have actually two heat pipes rather than just the one, as you can see in my handbrake test, where I encode a four gigabyte video file to MP4 and measure the time taken. Now, it is a long test, 
usually 30 to 45 minutes, depending on what CPU I use, but it does expose any CPU related heat issues. As you can see, the CPU hits 91 degrees Celsius, and as a result, it does perform slower than competing notebooks with the same CPU. So I applied a 115 millivolt undervolt and that brought it down to 85 degrees, which this is with the automatic fan selected. Activating the max fan with no undervolt gave the same time, but a cooler 80, de 80 degrees. So this shows how effective the max fan profile actually is. Air is sucked in from underneath and as a little and a little bit through the uh, some vents which are above the keyboard. Hot air from the CPU is blown out the rear vent um, and air from the GPU is blown uh, to the right rather than behind. I've never really understood the benefit of that as, as it does tend to blow the, the hot air towards your mouse. Although with this being a 17 inch chassis, it's a little bit deeper and uh, it's a little bit further away from you. So that's not so bad. Here we see that during uh, CPU work such as encoding or photo work, the CPU does get warm using the automatic fan, but activating the max fan, it certainly brings it down nicely. Let's see what we get uh, during gaming. Across six games, the CPU was at 83 degrees Celsius using the auto fan. Applying 115 millivolt undervolt, we again see a nice drop to 70 degrees, which is replicated when we use the max fan profile. Now the GPU temperature is fairly steady, seeing a two degree reduction when we apply the max fan. One can maintain uh, a quieter system just by undervolting. So, you know, I really recommend just doing that. At full load, it pulls 120 watts from the wall. So certainly for the non-gaming use, uh, use of an external battery bank can be used to supplement its internal battery. Using the auto fan, the max fan at load was 38 decibels. Using the max fan profile, it went to 42 decibels. These are very quiet fans, and I am impressed that with just an undervolt, you can get a really cool system at 38 decibels. I think if they had a second heat pipe on the CPU, it would have been even better. The fans can actually be controlled using the Control Center software. This is the same software as you get on Clevo machines. Gigabyte actually doesn't include their own software here, which I think is actually quite a, is a shame because they do usually have the option for a silent mode. Still, you, create a, you can create a custom fan profile and have the fans kick in at a higher temperature, should you wish. The system has a two and a half inch hard drive and an M.2 PCI Express SSD from Samsung. Now my unit has a 512 gigabyte one and it is quite fast with a read speed of 3.2 gigabytes per second and a write speed of 1.5. This equates to a boot time of about 16 seconds. One thing I was impressed with was that the CMOS battery was in full view, so it is easily taken out if needed. The Intel Wi-Fi card is also easy to replace. So all in all, I really do like how accessible everything is. The trackpad uses Windows Precision drivers and is smooth with, set with uh, separate mouse buttons, which aren't too loud when or stiff when you're pressing. Both scrolling and pinch to zoom works well. And the keyboard has uh, two millimeter of key travel and they do not feel mushy. They've got good tactile feedback. Pressing FN and uh, escape brings up the control center. Here you can choose between four different power profiles. Performance, as one would expect, lets the CPU boost to its uh, maximum uh, clock speed. Quiet brings the CPU down to 1700 megahertz, but note that it still keeps the Windows power profile at high performance. Power saving brings the CPU down to 898 megahertz and also changes the Windows profile to power saver. It also activates airplane mode. Now entertainment appears to have the same reaction as uh, performance, but in my testing, you do take a little bit of a hit. So I, recommending, I recommend using the performance setting unless you need to save power. You also have the ability to create macros, either assigned to uh, the keyboard or to your mouse. The trackpad has, the, has buttons to control your, your keyboard lighting. The one next to the uh, numlock activates the uh, FlexiKey lighting software. The next button turns uh, the uh, lighting on and off and the, the right hand buttons uh, decrease or increase the, the key brightness. There are a number of uh, lighting profiles available, um, such as wave or flashing. You can configure the, the whole keyboard uh, to, to have the same colors, or you can split it into three different zones. Using the light wheel allows you to choose from over 16 million different colors. Now the webcam can be turned off and on via the FN and the F10 key. Here's what it looks like. So this is the HD webcam, 720p. This is what it looks and sounds like. Now let's look at how it performs. Citibench R15 multi-threaded benchmark gives a score of 732 points, right in line with other models with the same CPU.
Using Adobe's Lightroom to convert uh, 50 photos to a video slideshow, we get 12 minutes, 18 seconds. That is great performance and even beats the Asus Zephyrus. That actually costs twice as much. Using MSI Afterburner, I was able to do a nice overclock with an extra 235 megahertz on the core and the memory maxed out. I therefore show frame rates are both stock and uh, overclocked. Battlefield 1, auto settings at 1080p. The Dell Inspiron does, uh, does pivot here, but overclocking the GPU brings it into line. The GTX 1060 is 18% faster. In Doom, the Sabre 17 did very well. It beat the Dell Inspiron 15 by 10% and overclocking it gave an additional 10%. 80 FPS is fantastic. Mafia 3 at 720p causes stuttering, which isn't present at 1080p with high settings. Nice and smooth at a playable 32 FPS, which again sees a 10% increase when overclocked. Still, the GTX 1060 isn't in reach, uh, besting it by 38%. Now, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is a new one for me, and usually sees me running around in my underwear. This game is still in development, so, you know, it isn't terribly optimized, but I was able to squeeze out 38 FPS at 1080p using ultra settings. Rainbow Six Siege 1080p and max settings sees a similar performance uh, to the Dell. Overclocking yielded a nice 15% improvement here. As you can see, the GTX 1050 is much further back, so I definitely recommend paying that extra $100 for the 1050 Ti. Switching to uh, ultra settings, which uh, basically just lowers the multi-sample uh, anti-aliasing, allows you to get a good 77 FPS, which still beats the Dell. Finally, Rise of the Tomb Raider DX12 1080p near max settings. The Sabre 17 and Dell are similar and the uh, former overclocking slightly better. Again, we see the GTX 1050 far behind and when overclocked, the Sabre 17 is 25% behind the GTX 1060, but still, 52, 52 FPS at these settings is, uh, is great. To conclude then, I really did like the Gigabyte Sabre 17. It's easy to hold in one hand. So portability is very good and uh, it's a big plus for me, as is the non-bling. So, you know, it can really be worked in, uh, used in a uh, workplace situation. It is easy to upgrade its components. Nothing is hidden away. And even the heat sinks look easy to remove should you want to perhaps repaste it. The CPU temperatures do get a little bit warm, so I do recommend using an undervolt or changing the fan profile, but the fan noise is very low. In fact, it's max low quiet without the hefty price tag to go with it. It's also good how you have three display outputs making multiple monitor use very easy. The screen is perhaps is good. Perhaps it could be uh, perhaps a little bit brighter, but the color accuracy is as good as the uh, more expensive Aero 15. The gaming performance I found was very consistent and in general is uh, slightly better than that of the Dell Inspiron 15 7000 gaming. I do like how there is very little bloatware on it and you do have the option to download some utilities uh, from the Gigabytes website. The speakers are reasonable uh, but do lack a little bit of depth because there's no subwoofer there. But to be honest the webcam is probably its, uh, its weakest part. But you know it's still usable. All in all though I give it a good score of 83%. Now, thank you for watching, and if you're interested in buying this laptop, please click on the Amazon link, which I have down in the description below. Now, I'm going to be going away for two weeks, so I will be a little bit, little bit quiet for a bit, um, but I will try to respond to all of your questions. So, I'll see you when I get back. Bye.